Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast by the Army Management Staff College, where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army profession. In today's episode, we meet with the author of the new Army Doctrine publication, 6.0, Mission Command, Command and Control of Army Forces. Welcome to this edition of Leader Up. And on today's edition, we have uh, a very interesting topic to talk about, something that is uh, in the hearts and on the minds of a lot of Army professionals out there, and that is Mission Command. And specifically, today we're going to talk about uh, the the publishing of ADP 6.0. Uh, the new version of that was published in July of 2019, and we've got a very special guest today on Leader Up to talk about that. Uh, I want to welcome Mr. Chuck Schrankel, and Chuck is the Mission Command Division Chief at the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate right here at Fort Leavenworth. And so, Chuck, Welcome to Leader Up, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, David. Thanks for having me over. All right, thank you. So let's let's just jump right in uh, and start talking about Mission Command. And I'm going to just ask you this question and give me uh, whatever thoughts you have. What is Mission Command? Aside from the definition that we have right now, where we define it as the Army's approach to command and control. Uh, fundamentally, Mission Command is about empowering your subordinates to make and implement decisions within your intent whenever the situation changes to the point uh, that you're, that their orders no longer apply uh, or they are tasked they don't believe are appropriate. Okay. And th- this new version of uh, 6.0 that was published in July of 2019, what is different about this version uh, as compared to previous versions? Yeah, there's a lot in this book compared to the last version. Uh, the first thing, if you take a look just at the cover, uh, is the name of the book. It's entitled Mission Command, Command and Control of Army Forces. Uh, so we have brought command and control back into the Army lexicon. Uh, some people think that that's a bad thing. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Uh, what we've done is is kind of given the Army a lexicon again that allows them to discuss command and control and mission command as kind of separate things. Uh, when we published ADP and ADRP 6.0 back in 2012 and we rescinded, you know, a fairly rich language that we had that included command, control, command and control, battle command, mission command. Uh, and when we made everything mission command – you know, it's kind of hard to understand what people are talking about when you enter a conversation. Are they talking about mission command as we consider it to be command and control or mission command as we consider it to be the, the system or mission command as we consider it to be a philosophy or an approach to command and control? So by just making that minor change of, rena- of, of allowing people to talk about command and control again, we can talk about mission command as kind of something special. So we made mission command something special instead of everything that's related to command and control. So I think that's a really big deal. And I I, I heard people uh, in the past year uh, use this phrase. I don't know if you heard it, but the phrase was um, mission command is gone, uh, command and control is back. And that, that is not the right way to look at uh, this this version of 6.0. No, it's absolutely incorrect. And I'd like to thank some of my buddies out there like Dr. Mann who, you know, put out a little cartoon about Mission Command being chased down by death. But uh, no, nothing's farther from the truth. Mission Command is alive and well in U.S. Army doctrine. I think the issue is, is, is that for years there's kind of been a fundamental misunderstanding. You know, since 2010, we've made a comparison between Mission Command and Command and Control. And really that's kind of a, a bad argument, a fallacious argument. Uh, doctrinally, and we've had doctrine on mission command since 2003, you know, the comparison has been between mission command and detailed command. Uh, if you're the Marines, mission command and control or detailed command and control and kind of the balance between the two that you're going to use while exercising command and control. Uh, somewhere along the line, somebody made the mistake or started to make the comparison that command and control was bad and mission command was good. Command and control is not bad. Command and control is necessary for the conduct operations. It's how you exercise command and control that what matters. And that's where we as an Army say we prefer mission command, all right, where we like to 
uh, empower subordinates to make and implement decisions. However, comma, you know, it's okay to be detailed command, uh, exercise detailed command every once in a while uh, uh, in certain situations. And w- one of the other things that I saw different uh, in the July 2019 version uh, is with the the actual principles. Uh, the the old version had six, and the new one has seven. Can you just uh, tell us why the, why the there's another principle, what it is, and and what's different about um, the other principles as well? The the principle has been an interesting discussion for a couple of years now, and and uh, you know I think the ideas behind them really haven't changed with maybe one or two exceptions. Uh, if you go back to 2003, we kind of had four elements of mission command, all right? Commander's intent, subordinate initiative, uh, mission orders, and prudent risk. Uh, when you jump forward to 2012, we kind of changed those a little bit. And, and there's some things, some ideas that we'd written to in the book, but we kind of made them principles underneath uh, the 2012 version of 6.0. Uh, we reevaluated those principles when we made uh, well, during this last revision, uh, and the first one is we added is called is competence. Okay, so we did add a principle called competence, and we kind of have tied that back to FM three O in the increased focus on large scale combat operations, uh, and the fact that you just don't go out and do mission command. You, you, you know, I mean, you have to be trained. Your guys have to go through tough, repetitive, realistic training, and and be competent at what they do. Uh, it, so that you can trust them, okay, while they're executing operations. Uh, so it's not it's not something that happens immediately. It's not something that just happens. Uh, and so we felt adding competence was important. Uh, we took the team building piece out. The team building is a is a fundamental. I don't think we didn't think belong there. It's still written to in the manual. It's just farther back in the chapter on command. But the trust piece is really the mutual trust piece is really what mattered. Uh, and then we modified uh, uh, the risk discussion, okay? The discussion itself hasn't changed that much, but we, we don't talk in terms of prudent risk anymore. We talk in terms of risk acceptance. And that was because the leadership, CAC leadership, felt that uh, the prudent uh, implied a certain timidity. And, and, and prudent to them meant you sit back and wait for permission rather than uh, uh, assessing the risk, mitigating what you can, and then accepting – you know, the risk that remains. So so those are kind of the big changes uh, to the principles. And so that one you said, it, it used to be uh, build cohesive teams. Through mutual trust. Through, right. right. And that and that's now changed to. Uh, it's mutual trust. OK. So it's 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 a little bit shorter. And then and then go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you're fine. I'm listening. The uh, first of all. I don't know how many times you read the build teams through mutual trust piece. I've read it for years, and I never really understood what it meant. Uh, so the trust piece I get, though, and that makes sense. To me, the team building was a different discussion. Traditionally, I don't think that rose to the level of a, a uh, principle as we kind of define it in doctrine, uh, although it is, I think, part of being what you do as a commander. You know, very much it's part of what you do as a commander. And we've left that discussion in the book. It's just in a different section. Okay, and anything else on the that you wanted to say about the principles? Because I was going to ask you uh, when I look at the order in the, in the new version, yeah. the order is different from the old one. And is was there uh, a, a thought process or rationale to to kind of changing those around? There's 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 two other things kind of related to the principles. First is going to be the order. All right. Uh, when I looked at the order of the old principles, I just – the logic just wasn't there to me. So it was simply trying to come up with a logic, uh, you know, of why we ordered the principles the way we did. When you go through doctrine and look, there's always a list and list of things. Uh, really what you – and that's okay to have a list, but what you want is there to be some logic to it, if at all possible. And so when we sat down and looked at all these principles and how they might be applied and when – kind of this is the order we came up with, okay? You know, so first was competence, all right? And the competence leads uh, the, the mutual trust. Uh, and, you know, based on the competence and the mutual trust, it's easier to achieve the shared understanding. And once you have that, then you have commanders that can issue an intent 
uh, uh, in mission, you know, using mission orders so that their subordinates can exercise an uh, initiative while taking risks during the conduct operations. So that's all kind of a very long run on sentence, but in my mind, that's kind of how I broke it down. There's probably other ways to do it, but that's kind of what we agreed on when we were staffing the manual. And and I did I did find it interesting, and it was completely logical to me when I looked at that new list that it all starts with a a bedrock of competence, and that didn't used to be there. And it did jump out at me that how can you do all these other things if you don't start with uh, a, a trained and ready force which equals competence? The uh, the other thing about the principles is the length. You know. We had, we've tried to go to one-word principles. Uh, if you look at like the principles of war or the principles of unified land operations, they're just kind of one word, you know, mass, objective. And right. then there's some explanatory writing underneath. I just think it's easier for people to remember that. Uh, you know, so we took, you know, sentences that were that long and tried to go with one or two-word uh, principle kind of overarching descriptions and then get to the big ideas underneath it. There's been a bad tendency in doctrine over the last probably 10 years to sacrifice clarity for accuracy. Uh, And we've written in some very detailed manner uh, and some some very detailed things. The problem with that, though, is, is the minute something changes, the second something changes, then you have to go back and redo you know, and sometimes you have to go back and redo a lot of the work that you've done already because your house of cards is so finely built that any little change is going to knock it down. And and that gets back to how fast the manuals change. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the Marine Corps Doctrine uh, Publication 6, Command and Control. That book's been – it was published in 1996. And it is still as valid today as it was when they published it in 1996. They've had one change, I think, in 1998 when they made it general neutral. And my goal would be to have a command and control book that survived almost that, almost that long. Right. So that's kind of the art piece of enough detail so guys understand versus so much detail that the minute something changes in the operations manual or, or you know, in another book, uh, that you have to revise your whole your whole construct, your whole model. And these these principles, uh, even even though they are recently, I say recently uh, for this generation codified, uh, these have been principles in the United States Army for hundreds of years. Is that a tr- is that a true I, statement? I, I don't know of hundreds. I think some of them have been. You know, the idea of uh, uh, subordinate initiative and mission orders certainly has been. You can go back and look in early. Uh, field service regulations, you know, the very first field service regulation kind of has a passage that can be interpreted that way. Uh, you can go back and, uh, you know, read some Civil War history uh, and find out, you know, Grant was kind of a mission command kind of guy. You know, right. there's some quotations out there that, you know, Von Mulkey and Scharnhorst and Ganesh now would have been on board with uh, uh, in the way he operated. So, yes, uh, definitely. And I will tell you that they've been in doctrine for, you know, as long as I can remember. Again, Command and control doctrine is relatively new in uh, in the Army. We only published our first manual in 2003. Uh, but really, none of the ideas in the current ADP-60, you know, all the ideas in the current ADP-60 were in that manual in some way, shape, or form. And even uh, right here where we're at, if you're – are you familiar with the story of uh, how Henry Leavenworth uh, established Fort Leavenworth on the Kansas side of the river – when his orders originally were, yeah, to go West on West Bottoms, right? yeah, and he got here and said that doesn't make sense, and so he used his own initiative and took some level of risk and said that makes more sense to go on the the high ground over uh, on the Kansas side. That would make an excellent vignette for the next version of this. Okay, all right, and le- and since you're talking about the vignettes, um, uh. Let me just ask this: the version, the the July twenty nineteen version, added more vignettes and more quotes. There was, I think, one in the old one that I saw. Uh, I don't recall what it was, but the new one is robust with quotes and vignettes. And what was the mindset uh, or the philosophy that uh, ha- had those vignettes go back in? The uh Quotes and vignettes were part of doctrine while while I was growing up in the Army since 1983. 
uh, when we transitioned to this Doctrine 2015 program and we were going to make everything shorter and kind of break down the information into categories, one of the things we got rid of to save space were quotes and vignettes. And so we used to use quotes and vignettes to kind of – as teaching points to kind of stimulate thought to get guys thinking about maybe the big idea. Some people are learned that way. Uh, and and so we went five years without putting quotes or vignettes in manuals. Uh, in 2017, when we decided we were going to write FM30, uh, you know, General Lundy was CAC commander at the time and he wanted quotes and vignettes. You know, General Lundy is a man – he's intimately familiar with doctrine. He reads it. He understands it. He memorizes it. He knows it probably better than half of us do, you know, the guys that write it, unfortunately. Uh, but he wanted quotes and vignettes back in doctrine – to prove points, to, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of assist in understanding. So our charter, as we revised this last set of ADPs that published in July, was to go back, bring back quotes, bring back vignettes, and that's exactly what we did. And uh, it makes perfect sense to do that. Uh, in my mind, uh, our doctrine is our history, and our history is our doctrine. And if you look at current doctrine, it, it helps us understand – where we've been in the past and why sure. we are uh, where we are today. Um, let me ask about, since we're talking about the quotes, I want to ask you about uh, a quote from everybody's uh, favorite uh, military author, uh, Carl von Clausewitz. Uh, and this is in uh, the new version of uh, 6.0. And he said, quote, I love this quote. It's everything in war is very simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. The difficulties accumulate and end by producing a kind of friction that is inconceivable unless one has experienced war. Friction makes the apparently easy so difficult. And so just. Uh, address why that quote is there and how that quote would help me understand the the Army's theory behind mission command. <clears throat> I, I think it gets to the idea that that as an Army, uh, you know, one of our ideas is that in order to uh, get inside the enemy's decision cycle, you have to make and implement decisions faster than he does. Uh, when you look at the number of decisions that need to be made during any single operation, there's no way one guy can do that. And so we believe that, that the way to conduct operations is to empower your subordinates to make and implement decisions. The guy on the ground who ha may have a better understanding, a share, certainly a shared understanding of your intent and, and the reason of – or, or you know, why we're conducting this operation – uh, but maybe a better understanding of the local situation, uh, will make decisions – and keep things going in accordance with your intent because things things are going to go wrong. You're not. We all know you don't write a plan and then execute that plan exactly as uh, as you think it's going to go. Uh, all kinds of things happen. People get lost. Thing, you know, vehicles run out of fuel. Uh, the enemy a absolutely gets a vote. Uh, and and so while you may be able to foresee some of this stuff as a commander, you certainly can't foresee all of it. And you, in fact, may not even be aware it's happening because you won't have communications with the guys that are that are executing uh, at the time. Uh, and then we kind of, I think we have that at the beginning. Is that the beginning of the control chapter? I think it is. Uh, you, you know, and that gets back to this idea of, you know, control is not about telling people what to do and making sure they do it. Control is about getting information so that you can understand the situation. And then, uh, you know, do you need to make any adjustments you know, to the plan to kind of still achieve your envisioned end state. So that's kind of where I believe that's where it's placed, and that's why I put it where I put it. And that uh, th that uh, fray that term friction is is quote unquote all the little things that go wrong that cannot be predicted to go wrong, and um, things things will go wrong or can go wrong that you would never have yeah. anticipated. And. Uh, and, and I'll tell you that, that, that one of the big complaints that we get is that, uh, you know, even in an environment where there's, where there's an excessive amount of control. So you have a more mature theater like we have right now in, in, in Afghanistan and there's a robust rules of engagement and, you know, there's all kinds of restrictions that are in place. 
uh, for for various reasons, and some of them are very good reasons. Okay, uh, you know, there's still opportunities for guys to exercise initiative within that environment. They are still expected to. They're going to come up against unexpected situations. They're going to be in situations. Uh, 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 they're going to be given a task that may no longer apply, and then they're going to have to, have to make decisions and, and take action. So even in that kind of environment where guys kind of think they're being micromanaged, uh, there's still the opportunity to exercise initiative. And in fact, you have to do it. There's a passage that I, I believe is new. Uh, and it is the the title of it is uh, it's page one dash fourteen, the role of subordinates yes. in mission command, and I, I'll just read a little bit of this, and we'll talk about what this means. Commanders expect subordinates to exercise authority to further the commander's intent. When changes in the situation render orders irrelevant, or when communications are lost, uh, and then it it goes on. Uh, I love this part, quote, subordinates do not wait for a breakdown in communications or a crisis situation to learn how to act within the commander's intent. Subordinates look for every opportunity to demonstrate and exercise initiative to the greatest extent possible. They report what they intend to do and then execute uh, unless their commander specifically denies them uh, permission. And so, uh, just correct me that that passage, uh, this section about the role of subordinates is new. This was not in the the old uh, the the old doctrine. And why was that put in? What what was the need uh, to to add uh, th- those words back in? You're correct. It's new, uh, and hopefully in the next turn I can expand on it, and make it a little bit better. Uh, one of the major complaints we have in the mission command. The 2012 version was, you know, it's commander centric. You, you know, we emphasize the commander. The commander's an important guy, uh, but really, we talked an awful lot about the commander, just empowering his guys to kind of go out and do things. Uh, and and when we took a look at it, we said, look, you, you know, again, there's competence involved in this, and not only do you know subordinates have to actively seek you know, the responsibility and prove themselves to the commander that they are capable of, you know, making decisions uh, within his intent. But the commander also has responsibility to train a subordinate. So there's a, there's another section in the command chapter, uh, under, 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 uh, guides to effective command that talks about training subordinates and command and control and mission command. So it's kind of a two way street. Everybody's got a role in it. Commander can't just exercise mission command without subordinates that are trained, that are willing to accept the responsibility, actively seek the responsibility, and then look for the, uh, the opportunity to exercise it, it, it every chance they get. Uh, that kind of ties back to the German model too. I'm not a historian. I read this stuff a lot, but I got a terrible memory. Uh, you know, that was a big part of, of, of the German Aufstrag tactique was you, you, you looked for the responsibility. You actively sought, I want the responsibility for this so I can prove myself to my boss. So we kind of – I didn't want to put it that way, but I kind of thought we had to bring that in there and that this was a commander and a subordinate, you know, kind of engagement, right? It was it was interaction between commanders and subordinates, not a commander thing. It wasn't a subordinate thing. One of the other complaints you used to get was if a commander told a subordinate to do something or checked on him, then you were violating mission command. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. Right. Okay. So, so I thought that was important. Uh, worked with the sergeant major over at the COE and a couple other sergeants major and got the feedback from them. Uh, again, I think we can probably expand that a little bit and add some more meat to it next time we write the book. And so, so if, if I start with that bedrock of competence, then when a subordinate takes action, I, I know that they're, they're competent to, 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 to do something that is within my intent if, I, if I'm the commander. Um, and then that that brings up, I believe it's the the second principle, mutual trust. And there's this passage uh, about trust. And I when I read this, it's it's almost like a circle. Um, as and this is a passage from from the doctrine. Uh, as subordinates realize their commander will support sound decisions, their trust increases. And they become more willing to to exercise initiative, 
And then as a commander sees subordinates perform in uncertain situations, they gain trust uh, in their uh, subordinates' judgment uh, and ability. And so we know that trust is one of the uh, essential characteristics of the Army profession. And so uh, can you just talk a little bit more about uh, the why trust is it and why is it such an important part of this uh, mission command? Trust is a, is, is a principle of mission command. You, you know, we wrote about trust. We said trust is really, really important, but we never kind of described, uh, you know, what that meant or how you might go about building that trust. Uh, I think as, as a, we do, you know, our mantra is trusted army professionals, uh, not just, you know, trusted servants of the nation, uh, according to the, uh, the, you know, profession doctrine that's out there. Uh, but also, I have in, – in situations we go into, specifically in large-scale combat operations, you know, I have to have subordinates that I can trust are going to do the things that need to be done. And those subordinates need to trust me that I have kind of got their back when things start to go wrong. Uh, if, if you don't do that, if that's not there, then it just absolutely kills initiative in my opinion. OK. And once the initiative is gone, then, then there's no way you can have mission command. And then there's that that passage about uh, from uh, the old an old, old, old FM 100-5 from 1941 uh, that says every individual from the highest commander to the lowest private must remember that inaction and neglect of opportunities warrants. Uh, more severe censure than an error of judgment in the action taken, and that is that's about trust, is it not? That that and that's old. That's from uh, right at the very beginning of of uh, World War II. I I I think it deals with trust. It deals with a couple things. It deals with trust. Uh, I think it deals with initiative as well. Uh, we used to have a section where we wrote about errors of commission and errors of omission uh, in in the 2003 version, which was, I thought, really good, but uh, it kind of fell out over the years. And, and basically it said, look, if, if a decision needs to be made, you know, you make the decision and you execute and the commander should back you up on that, right? As long as it meets some guidelines, right? It's within his intent and doesn't needlessly endanger lives and things like that. Um and, and we try to keep that flavor in this book. Uh, the other thing it kind of ties back to is how do we deal with uncertainty? And this is not just mission command, but it's kind of command or command control related. Uh, you, you know, one of the one of the defining problems of command control is how do you deal with uncertainty? And in the way we look at that, there's two ways to do that. One is to sit back and wait for more information to come in, which could cause you to miss an opportunity or actually increase risk. The other one is we want you to take action to go out and develop the situation. And we believe as an army that the action focused approach is, is kind of more appropriate. And that ties back to that as well. And th there was an, a quote, uh, at, uh, Fort Knox when I was there many, many years ago, something like, uh, uh, a good plan executed violently right now is better than the perfect plan. That, that takes so long to figure it out and get everybody's opinion on it. And we don't say that explicitly. We don't say it that way, right. but it's the, the idea is still in the book. Right. So. Um, and I want, I want to get back to, uh, you, you kind of talked about this a few minutes ago about the idea that, uh, one person is, is unable to, make all the decisions and have all the information uh, to, to make every decision that is needed to be made uh, on, on a battlefield or uh, in, in any environment for that matter. And the higher up you go, the, the less you can make every decision. And there's this quote from uh, Von Moltke. Uh, we're going back to uh, – what I believe is called off trogs tactic. You mentioned that earlier, which is, uh, that, that's, that's more the, the mission orders. Mission tactics kind right. of I think is the rough interpretation. Yeah. But anyway, this, this quote from Von Molke, I, I love this quote also. The advantage which a commander thinks he can attain through continued personal 
intervention is largely illusory. Uh, by engaging in it, he assumes a task that really belongs to others whose effectiveness he thus destroys. He also multiplies his own tasks to a point where he can no longer fulfill the whole of them. And uh, just how, how does that quote uh, relate to to mission command? Well, again, I think it gets to the heart of it. I mean, you know, if our army believes that, that the only way you can make and implement decisions faster than an opponent uh, is to empower your subordinates, then, you know, that just reinforces that point. Uh, I think that that operations the last 20 years or so have have kind of set a bad example. People have gotten used to having connectivity. They've gotten used to having systems in place. They've gotten used to seeing and being able to ask a thousand questions before they have to make a decision and act. That's not going to happen in large scale combat operations. It's just not. Yeah, I still kind of cracks me up that we spend all this money trying to develop the network and all kinds of gizmos. And then one of our first assumptions is that space and cyberspace are going to be degraded to the point where we have to operate in an analog environment. Uh, you know, which, which is kind of the way that I think we grew up. Uh, but commanders aren't going to know. They just are not. Uh, the guy on the ground uh, is going to see something happen. He's going to make an assessment. He's going to try to call back and have a discussion. There's nothing. It's not nothing wrong with calling back and having a discussion with the boss. All right, say it explicitly. Hey, go ahead and call. It's nothing wrong with you, you're not violating anything by calling and having a discussion with the boss to try to achieve that shared understanding, get feedback on a solution. If you can't do that, you know what? You make the decision and then you take action. And as long as it's within commander's intent then he should back you up on that. You should have enough trust there to where he's going to back you up on that. Uh, you know, there's kind of a uh, – misconception is not the right word, but but for as much mystique as the German Aufstrag that he has, you know, really there was kind of two types of orders they used to issue. You know, they had one that was very detailed, right? And I think it was called a BAFEL, right, B-E-H-F-E-L. And I know I'm, I'm butchering that uh, uh, pronunciation. But it was a very detailed order, right? It was march tables and supply and everything else that would get you up to basically the line of departure, all right? And then once you were at the line of departure, you kind of had a – they had this directive. Uh, and the directive was a mission-type order. And that was the one that just kind of gave the intent and kind of the general objective to be achieved. And now, uh, once you're engaged with the enemy and conducting operations uh, – uh, you, you know, that's when all the initiative got extra. That's when subordinates are truly expected to exercise their initiative. You know, initiative is a good thing, but not always a good thing. And we kind of give examples in there. There's some situations where you don't want a guy, you know, you want him to exercise initiative to keep things going, but you don't want him to go off completely doing his, you know, doing his own thing as he sees fit. Uh, and again, we have some things to think about in there before exercising subordinate initiative. You know, is this going to de- is this worth desync? How is this going to desynchronize the larger operation? You know, is it worth desynchronizing the larger operation and, and et cetera? And that that's partly why my guess is that uh, competence was was put in there is to keep people within okay disciplined initiative within a framework of competence, so that we're kind of operating off the same uh, basic concepts and ideas that. That's part of it. I don't know if it relates to competence so much as it just relates to initiative. When a guy, you know, discipline initiative, the discipline and discipline initiative alludes to the idea that, that you, you have boundaries. You know, your left and right limits are the commander's intent. Right. So, so that's what the discipline means. And I, let me just ask you a, a little clarity. Uh, explain what, what a mission order, a mission type order, what what that means? What specifically that means? Uh, FM six O is kind of the manual that contains all our doctrine on orders, right? And it talks about the types of orders that are out there, uh, and then it contains our orders formats and some other things. Uh, how you write that order is what's important. And when we talk about a mission order or a mission type order, I'm referring to a technique of writing an order, okay? That that really emphasizes uh, the what, not so much the how. Uh, so, you know, I envision kind of a base that, that, you know, has a fairly broad concept operation, you know, just enough control measures to synchronize an operation, uh, but doesn't get into too many details of telling a guy exactly how to execute that operation. Uh, any details like that can go in an axe. Now, that's kind of a in general statement. 
if you are just beginning to plan something, okay, like you've just gotten the word that you're going to deploy to Afghanistan in 18 months, sure, there's going to be a lot of detail that goes into that thing. It's not going to be a mission type order, okay? You're going to have a lot of detail trying to get guys from point A to point B with all their gear and all their supplies and everything else, all right? But once you're actually conducting named operations and, and sending out fragos and things like that, you probably are not going to worry as much. You should not get into as many of the details, or you won't have the time to get in so many details during large-scale combat operations we've had now. Uh, so, so to me, and the way we've described it in the book, is a technique for writing an order uh, that, that gives a guy enough leeway, you know, imposes just enough restraints on a guy uh, and gives him enough leeway so that he can actually exercise initiative within the intent. I want to ask you about uh – uh, Army civilians, the Army Civilian Corps, and, and how Mission Command relates to us in the Army Civilian Corps. Specifically, uh, somebody who is, let's say, a budget analyst at a Army depot somewhere, uh, a GS-12, 11, and has four or five subordinates, also Army civilians, that, that, that they lead. How is um, these – all the stuff that we talked about, how is it applicable to that person? I think that the idea of, again, empowering subordinates to make and implement decisions appropriate to the situation is applicable whether you're in a military organization or a civilian organization. And in fact, you know, in civilian business models, uh, you, you know, they teach that. Uh, when I go out to uh, – I can't remember his name now, but I was out at KU – you know, two summers ago to take a strategic planners course. And the Tom, oh, I can't remember his last name. Anyway, he's the head of their business department or was head of their business department. And he spent an entire day on mission command, basically. You know, he used the term, but really what he was talking about was how you empower your subordinates uh, uh, to keep things going. And, you, you know, you can tie it back. I think maybe we would tie it back in the civilian court like employee engagement. You know, I think it's a big part of how do you engage your employees by, you know, you got to train them. You know, you, you make sure they're competent. You build trust with them. You kind of, uh, uh, you know, understand what's going on together, and then you've empowered them to make decisions. If you're not around, so that things don't come to a complete halt. I mean, there's there's a lot of this transfers over. I believe the civilian the civilian corps, and in fact, I even have a line in the book that basically says, "Look, while we talk about this mission command within the construct of the conduct of operations that relates to command and control." You know, these are kind of like good leadership principles no matter what you're doing, right? So they can be applied in a variety of situations. Uh, one of the things I have to deal with is that I write doctrine for the conduct operations, right? I'm not writing doctrine for how you're operating in garrison or what Army civilians are doing or anything like that. I write doctrine on command and control and the operations process and during the conduct operations. So does it transition? Yes, absolutely. I believe it does. Okay. Let me just ask you, is there anything else about uh, the, the, this new version of uh, ADP-60 that we haven't talked about that, that you'd like to uh, touch on? There's only one thing else I'd like to say, and that has to do with the tasks. Uh, if you go back and look at the old manual and the tasks that we had in there, we kind of had this convoluted – you know, commander tasks, staff tasks, additional tasks. And I think there was like 14 total that we wrote to. And I'm still not convinced all of them were related to – I know they weren't related to mission command. I don't think they were related to command control either. Maybe the team building one was. So we took those and simplified them. So we only have four basic tasks now, right, four top-level tasks, command forces, control operations, drive the operations process and establish a command and control system. Uh, and so in this model – uh, I don't think that there's anything command and control related that can't be binned underneath, you know, one of those one of those four kind of four top level tasks. Uh, so that's kind of a, you know, we streamlined it. We, I think it's easier to understand, um, and and it certainly makes it simpler to write to when you're not writing to 14 separate tasks. Okay, and I wanted to ask one, just one more question, and that is about uh, the process of updating a, a piece of doctrine, uh, ADP-60. Number one, what was the process? 
Uh, how did where did the input come from, uh, and and what was your personal role uh, in all of that? Uh, on the lead, right? So I wrote the thing uh, this time around. Uh, it's my my manual. Uh, the, the big impetus for change in this was the publication of FM30 in 2017. Uh, that had a ripple effect. So FM30 publishes in 2017. We know we need to change the ADP sets. Uh, and so in, you, you know, January or March of 2018, I actually write an issue paper where I have gathered all the feedback I've gotten from the old 60. You know, it'd been out there for several years. I'd received emails. I'd, re- you know, received anecdotal evidence. I'd receive, uh, there's actually a form you can send in about suggestions to changes. You know, I keep kind of all that in a file. So I go through and assess all that. And then uh, I come up with an outline and I write an issue paper with proposed changes. And in this case, it was bring back command and control and bring back the command and control warfighting function and change the tasks and change the principles. Uh, you know, I kind of get buy-in from General Mingus at the time. I staff that issue paper army-wide and get feedback on that. And then once General Mingus decides which direction he wants to go, uh, I sat down and wrote a thing called a program directive, which is the basic outline of the book and the writing plan. That goes out for army-wide staffing. Everybody gets a vote. It comes back to me. Now I'm in the process of writing the manual. Actually, you don't wait till it comes back. I've been writing the manual the whole time. Uh, but I get a draft finished. It gets reviewed by the COE director, General Christmas at the time, at least three times. Um, you know, my boss reads it several times. Now it goes out for army-wide staffing. I mean, it goes out to every – down to division level, okay? You know, uh, and we get comments back from those guys. And we have to kind of review those comments, figure out whether they're acceptable or not. Some had to go up for adjudication by the trade-off commander. Uh, you know, believe it or not, discipline initiative. We just wanted to call it initiative. We didn't want to put a modifier on it. And, and people wanted dis- – they wanted discipline, but we ended up with risk, acceptance. You know, that was a General Townsend-level decision. Uh, originally, we had written to the Mission Command Warfighting Function to try to f- – we had written to the Mission Command Warfighting Function. You know, people said, look, it doesn't make any sense. It needs to be the Command and Control Warfighting Function because that's what allows you to do Command and Control, not Mission Command. And again, that was a General Townsend level decision. So, you know, you take those and present them to the CAC of the TRADOC leadership you get decision. So the bottom line is it's, you know, there's some art and science to it. There's a process. It's very collaborative or we try to be very collaborative. Yeah. And, and the end product has been looked at by an awful lot of, you know, kind of high level folks before it goes out. Yeah. I can't say that's true for every manual, but I can tell you it's definitely true for ADP 60 uh, on this last term. And so this, this, uh, uh a process like that ensures that uh, ADP 60 or uh, other pieces of doctrine that go through similar processes reflect current thought and current philosophy uh, in, in the United States Army. It, it makes sure it's nested and it also socializes the ideas. You, you know, when you get it out early enough and people have a chance to think about it, then they don't have a tendency to get really mad because they're surprised when it gets published. Right. And and General Townsend helped out tremendously when he wrote a series of articles on mission command starting, I think, in January or February. I can't remember now. Uh, where where the first one, he said, we're going to add cl- – he says, one of the things we've done wrong is we have muddled the doctrine. You, you know, we have made everything mission command – and because Mission Command is everything, Mission Command is nothing. And we're going to make Mission Command something special again. And we're going to do that by adding clarity to the doctrine and bringing back command and control. And so now, you know, I think the the, the taxonomy's there. We're nested with joint multinational. You know, that was always fun trying to explain to a you know an international general why Mission Command was really better than command and control. Uh, but now we are kind of nested with our joint multinational uh, partners out there. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chuck Schrankel from the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate. Thanks for coming by and talking to us today on Leader Up. Thanks for the opportunity. I could talk about this for hours. I'd love to come back again if you got follow up questions. If you have any questions about today's episode or this podcast, please check out the description for our email or for our website. Thanks for listening.